Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm not Stephen Wright. I'm Simon Foucault, just in case you came in late. Uh, so I, I will uh, speak about for four lectures on uh, compressive sensing. Uh, I will use slides and the blackboard a little bit. Uh, <coughs> so this first lecture is an introduction, an invitation to, uh, to the subject. So I will talk about uh, the standard compressive, pro compressive sensing problem, some applications, and uh, some basic algorithm. And I guess tomorrow, then I will go more into uh, the details. Uh, so um, let me start by saying uh, a few things. I'm assuming that you've heard about compressive sensing before, even just a little bit. And if you've heard a little bit about it, you associate three key words with the field, uh, which are sparsity. Uh, sparsity, which is so essential to, uh, to the theory, uh, can be replaced by other structures from time to time. But for the standard compressive sensing problem, we'll look exclusively at sparsity. Uh, another key word that is associated to the field is randomness. So it has somehow a different status, because this was uh, an essential part of the theory. This is essential to obtain the uh, best results available so far, but there is hope that one day uh, this is not uh, essential. This won't be essential anymore. And uh, this is associated with the uh, measurement process. There is the measurement process and the reconstruction process. And often uh, associated with the reconstruction process, you think about optimization, and there will be I think two courses where there is, in this winter school, optimization is a title. So I actually uh, probably won't talk a lot about that. Uh, and also, it is a preferred method of reconstruction, whereas there are uh, alternatives that are available. So you see that they, they, those three keywords they do not quite have the same status. Okay. So let me jump into um, basically the standard compressive sensing problem, what we are trying to solve. Um, oh, I should say something important, compressive sensing. Why compressive sensing? Uh, where does the name come from? It's because we try to compress and sense or acquire the data at the same time. Uh, and uh, an example that is typically given to uh, illustrate the fact that compress I mean, acquiring data first and compressing uh, them later is, is wasteful is uh, the example of a digital camera, or actually what is being done. I am told, I'm repeating that. When you press a button, you acquire all the pixels uh, possible, and then there's a, um, a phase in your digital camera that compress uh, the picture to, uh, I don't know exactly how many uh, pieces of information it, it keeps, but maybe only 5% of the information, which would be enough to give you a, a good quality uh, picture afterwards. I saw, again, compressive sensing. We want to do the uh, compression and the acquisition at the same time. Otherwise, it can be a wasteful process. OK, so uh, after we model uh, the problem, we arrive at, at the following uh, setup. We want to reconstruct or find a, a signal. So signal is a vector, basically. Right? So it's a vector of size capital N, and N is very large. So a signal, in fact, will be something else, but it will be represented as uh, in a basis, in a given basis. And what we look at is a vector of coefficients in the basis. Right? So that this is there's already a, a modeling step that is hidden behind that and that we actually do not talk about in the mathematical theory. So this is a known, and it's high dimensional. And k here can be either r or c, the, the field of real number or complex number. Uh, this uh, x will be acquired uh, through a vector y of measurements. Uh, this one will have a dimension m, m as in measurements, and m is, in fact, much smaller than n. <coughs> So we want to recover something of with n large degrees of freedom from only m small observations. So you should say, well, that 
probably is not possible in general. In general, of course, it is not, but uh, there is, we will make the assumption that X is not a general signal. Uh, it is, in fact, sparse, meaning that the number of non-zero components of X is small. And that will save the day. All right, so in that case, the objective is to find on the one side, ways to gather some information about X, so to find something protocols that keep enough information about X to recover it, and on the other side, find recovery protocols, ways to, to uh, perform the reconstruction. So the goal is, in fact, twofold. First, find some measurement matrix because we're going to say that the measurements we take are linear measurements, so you might actually represent the process by, by your matrix, and Y will be equal to A times X, okay? And uh, some reconstruction maps, uh, we'll call them delta. Uh, those ones take measurement vectors and should uh, give back all signals of dimension N. What we hope is that when you measure x, so you form Ax, and then you uh, apply the reconstruction procedure, so delta of Ax, you should recover the original vector x. Of course, again, that's not possible for every x, but it will be possible for every uh, s-sparse vector. Right? So this is, this is the hope, and this is the standard compressive problem summarized in this way. Now, I won't talk too much about two other issues that have to be considered. Uh, and I really emphasize that they have to be considered, but I'm not going to actually do it uh, during those, uh, those four lectures. Uh, but in realistic situation, X is not exactly sparse. Right? So your picture, for example, is not exactly sparse in a wavelet uh, basis, for example, but only a few uh, number of, of coefficients are significant rather than non-zero. So in, in practice, X is not exactly sparse, but compressible, so meaning almost sparse. And uh, the measurements you take usually contain some error. So the vector Y uh, of measurements will be equal to AX plus some non-zero vector E. So those two issues have to be considered, and when we do the reconstruction, we want the reconstruction error, so delta of AX minus X in some norm, to be controlled by <coughs> the distance of X to sparse vectors and uh, so the magnitude of this error as well. So all the algorithm that I'm going to show you are stable and robust, uh, but I'm not going to prove uh, the stability and robustness in general. Okay, so let's, uh, let me give you just a, a few applications. Um, <coughs> you can find more in, in our book that I, I will bring a copy tomorrow. Uh, so uh, I think originally this was the first application to be put forward to, to show the, um, the power of compressive sensing was in uh, magnetic resonance <coughs> imaging. <coughs> And so this picture uh, was given to us by those two people. Uh, where, so in uh, magnetic resonance imaging, the uh, measurements that are taken are Fourier measurements. And uh, usually uh, there is a lot of them being taken. But taking a lot of MRI measurements is problematic because it means that the patient has to stand still, to, to not breathe too much, and then takes time to take a measurement, so the whole process is long, and if you are dealing with children, you ask them to, to stand still for two eight minutes, I don't know, uh, that, that can, can be a problem. So um, <coughs> here we have a, a picture that is produced uh, through uh, usual means, which would be a uh, least square, I believe, in this case. Uh, and then you don't you see that it's not very sharp. It's not very sharp here as well, but it's better on the uh, on the screen uh, because there are things that you do not see here uh, that you well physicians are able to interpret. Okay, and uh, I think the uh, 
it was shown that using compressive sensing or compressive sensing ID <coughs> in, this, uh, in this process can gain you a factor of eight in times compared to uh, traditional methods. Um, okay, so uh, another example will be uh, in sampling theory. So we have here uh, a signal, right? So here signal means this oscillating function, which is a, a super superposition of sinusoid. Um, and so we uh, sample it, meaning that we take point evaluations. Uh, so the, those black dots will be point evaluations of, <coughs> of that function. <coughs> and uh, using Shannon Nyquist theorem, you basically you can say that uh, if you look at the uh, bandwidth of the function, so basically the uh, uh, oscillation of, of the largest sinusoid present there, uh, you should uh, sample at a rate that is twice the, um, the frequency. But if, if, if you have maybe just take this simple example of just one sinusoid, uh, but with a very large frequency, that means that you should sample very, uh, very often. Uh, using techniques from compressive sensing, you can bypass this a little bit because it's just one sinusoid, so it's something that is one sparse in reality, so you should be able to do something, something better. And here in this picture, <coughs> the reconstruction is already shown, but it looks exactly the same as, as the original uh, function. And uh, it's, well, when we know the theory, it's not a surprise the reconstruction is exact because uh, there was some, uh, uh, so the coefficient vector of this, this function in the basis of sinusoid, it's, it's false. <coughs> And okay, so there is a, a stylized application in error compression that I'm going to uh, to show you as well here. So I'm going to use a board for this one. Uh, okay. So let's see if I do remember that. Uh, so I want to transmit a vector z uh, of dimension lil n. So it's not the same capital N as before. Uh, so for that, I want to, uh, to form. Right, so what's going to happen in the, in the transmission? There's going to be some error. And so we want uh, to uh, be able to correct the error. Uh, so if we just have n pieces of information and send n pieces of information <coughs> intuitively, if there is some error coming into play, we won't be able to correct it. So we form a vector of dimension a little larger. Uh, so let's call it z, uh, which will be a matrix B applied to, to z, and that will be uh, of dimension capital N, where N, as I said, should be uh, uh, intuitively larger than little n. So little n plus something that I'm going to call little m for some reasons that you're going to see. And that basically is the amount of, of redundancy. <coughs> OK, so we're going to transmit z as the receiver uh, on his part uh, will receive a corrupted version of uh, it's not z. I want to use a, a another notation, so let's say v. Uh, but you receive w, which is a corrupted version of v. So it's going to be v plus some error. Now the error here, I'm going to call it x, because what I'm saying is that most of the uh, entries of V will be correctly transmitted, but some of them will be wrong. Right. So uh, X basically will be uh, a vector that is mostly, its entries are mostly zero, some of them are non-zero. But they are unknown, the amount of, of error we make. Uh, so where X, uh, so X is in R, N 
is sparse. <coughs> okay, so the receiver sees W, and the game is to find Z. But he, he knows the matrix A, and you also know the matrix A, the matrix B is what is known. And if you have the knowledge of B, you can uh, define a matrix A and construct it as well. If we say construct <coughs> A, which will be a matrix of size M times N, such that I want that A apply to B equal to 0. Okay, so it means that the uh, M rows of A are orthogonal to the uh, <coughs> to the n little n columns of of b. Okay, so then the receiver will uh, form uh, will look at y, which will be a apply to w. Again, he has access to both of those. So a apply to W is A applied to V, V being B times Z. Right? So, and then you've got A applied to X. Of course, by construction, this is zero. Okay? So, the receiver knows Y, uh, wants to find X. Uh, X is, is a, is a vector of large dimension, y is a vector of small dimension, and x is s sparse. So this is the typical compressive sensing problem. Right? So using techniques from compressive sensing, provided you have a nice matrix A, which means that you started with a nice matrix B as well. So you can recover you, as a uh, receiver, you can recover x. Well, that's not exactly what we want, but we're almost there. What we want is z. But if we have x and uh, we also know w, we can deduce v. And uh, we want z, knowing v. But in fact, this is an overdetermined system. So that this one we can solve. <coughs> so you obtain finally uh, x by solving an overdetermined system, not x, z, by solving uh, an overdetermined system. Okay, so when I say application of compressive sensing in error correction, take the word applications in the sense of a stylized application rather than really people in error correction using this. I don't know if they really do, but uh, <coughs> that shows you what is what is possible. Okay, so. Is everybody, is everybody still looking at that? Okay, so I'll wait a little bit before I put it down. Uh, in the meantime, any questions at this point? Yes. So is it uh, possible to construct a narrative matrix that has a zero probability property with respect to the unit B or? Well, if I don't think if you take any any B, uh, no. But if, if you grab those probabilities, yes. Yes. Right. Right. So the other point uh, Massimo is making is uh, that to to be able to use techniques from compressive sensing, you need A to have certain properties, and uh, <coughs> can you uh, construct A to have these properties? Well. If B is given, uh, in fact, the property of A that you want depends on the null space. And what did we say? We did say 
Well, that, that says something about the null space of A. Uh, and if, uh, if B is arbitrary, I mean, given to you, the null space of A will be determined, and then you cannot do a, anything really, really good. However, if you choose B properly, so that it's null space, or no, not it's null space in that case, it's image, uh, <coughs> uh, it's nice, uh, then, then you're in good shape. And because the construction of compressive sensing matrices are random, you take random matrices, if you start with a random matrix B, the matrix A you're going to construct will have the good properties uh, that you need. Okay. Right, so I think I, I can keep going now. Uh, so I'm just going to talk briefly about, I think, more application, just one more. Which this is this is something that I've done with uh, uh, colleagues, and which is a little more original than what we usually see. It's in metagenomics, and metagenomics is the uh, <coughs> uh, the study of a bacterial community uh, through their bulk DNA sequence, meaning that you have you know, unknown species in an environmental sample, you want to know the uh, contents of this, of this sample, how many uh, species you have from what sort. But what you can see is DNA, parts of DNA, uh, of the DNA of the whole sample. Right? You, you don't target uh, specific species, you just see something. Uh, so here in this case, X is a vector, a large dimensional vector. It contains the uh, unknown concentration of bacteria, of the bacteria whose genome have been sampled already and uh, that are in the database. And the database at the time, or two years ago, was about one quarter of a million. Uh, so it will be uh, realistic to make the assumption that in an environmental sample, you don't have too many species, bacterial species. Right, you won't have uh, one for each of the uh, quarter of a million of them. You will have maybe 100 or something like that. So the sparsity assumption is realistic. Uh, also, something that there's some extra structure if you want uh, the sparsity to the vector x is that it's not negative and as a concentration vector, its entry is sum up to one. Now, why? Uh, is will be the vector of size m. m will be 4 to the power 6, and 4 to the power 6, 4 is the size of the DNA alphabet, A, C, T, G, and to the power 6 because we take words, uh, we consider words, subwords of size 6. So for when we do the uh, sequencing, we basically obtain some short reads of about 100 to 500 base pairs. So we have a DNA word, or several of them, or a lot of them, DNA words of size, let's say, 100. And we're going to run a window of size 6 to uh, see uh, which subwords are present in there. And we're going to look at the frequency of each of them. Those things in, uh, are called six males in, uh, in genomics. Uh, OK, and there are several ways to, to, to do that, either 16S. Uh, sequencing or whole genome sequencing, but this is not the point. The point is that uh, if you do the same thing, uh, you know, as you constructed the matrix A, uh, the vector Y from, from the reads that you have, and if you do the same thing, counting the frequency of six males for each of the uh, uh, <coughs> bacteria that have been sequenced on, on their DNA genomes, their genomes, uh, then you form the colon of the matrix A. Uh, and uh, again, this is a, a matrix that has some nicer properties than general matrices, uh, same as before. Uh, the, the entries are non-negative, and they sum up to one along the colon. Um, and we have basically y equal ax, or approximately equal to ax. Remember what I said about in realistic situation. Uh, the measurement error have to be taken into account. Well, here, there will be measurement error. 
But then applying techniques from compressive sensing allowed us to uh, create some new algorithm that works much faster than uh, traditional methods. Uh, so this is what the only thing I want to say about this problem. You have a question? So the randomness, there's no randomness. All right, so uh, randomness, as I said at the beginning, is a, <coughs> is a way to construct good matrices. Now, the matrix here is given to us. Right? It is good because intuitively, you always think of DNA sequences as something random. So it has randomness built in. It is not good if you try to recover vectors that are non-negative, not non-negative, so which have negative entries, but it is good for uh, recovering uh, non-negative vectors. In a way, yeah, if you on a higher level, you say, well, this matrix has randomness built in into it. Um, OK, so uh, I'm closing this parenthesis on a further applications that you, you don't see uh, very often and come back to uh, <coughs> the, um, the problem you want to solve. So uh, keep that in mind. The problem is y equal ax, where the matrix A has many more rows than many more columns than rows. And x is sparse. Now, um, let's look at this expression, which is the L the piece power of the LP quasi norm, P will be taken small. So it's the sum of the absolute value of the xj to the power P. If you make P go to 0, uh, what, do you, what happens is that, well, if this was 0 already, that stays 0. But if this was non 0, it becomes 1 as P goes to 0. So basically, that is uh, the limit of each. Uh, summon is 1 if xj is non-0, 0, zero otherwise. Uh, and so when you sum all of that, you're basically counting the number of non-zero entries in x. So it's the sparsity of x. Uh, so well, because of that, we call the sparsity, uh, a notation for the sparsity is this norm symbol uh, sub-0. I, I would have put a, a power 0 as well here uh, to be consistent. But that's not the way people uh, look at it. So this notation stands for the uh, cardinality of the support of x. And you will see it very often. It has nothing to do with the norm, uh, but that's the notation that's being used. Now, when we have, uh, we want to solve y equal ax with the assumption that x is sparse, we will look basically at the solution of this linear problem, uh, which is as sparse as possible. So uh, that's what we call the L0 problem. Uh, find the, OK, so here P0 minimize the L0 norm subject to a measurement constraint. And uh, well, you can convince yourself that there is equivalence between saying that x is a unique s bar solution of, uh, of, uh, of the linear system if and only if x is reconstructed as the solution of P0. Now, P0 itself is a hard problem. In fact, as hard as you can get, and P hard, uh, because it's combinatorial in nature. How would you find the sparsest solution to a linear system? Well, you would look at all the, uh, say, subset of size S, solve uh, Ax is equal y with a constraint that Z is supported on S. Uh, and sometimes it's not possible, so you don't do it. Sometimes it's possible, then you keep it. Uh, and you see you know, which one of the solution is the sparsest. But doing that, you need to uh, um, look at how many supports. Uh, it would be n choose s, and that's very large when n is large. So it's, it's too much. So we need to do something else. So now, what is uh, the minimal number of measurements to recover uh, an s sparse signal? Well, let's see. Uh, Let's look at this condition. Every s sparse vector is the unique solution of az equal ax. So that will be equivalent to saying that the null space of A cannot intersect 
as a set of vectors that are 2 s sparse, or cannot intersect or intersect trivially to intersect at zero. Right? It goes, let's say, uh, in one direction. Uh, if you have two solutions that are sparse, let's say <coughs> z and x, then z minus x is in the null space of A, and it's also 2 s sparse. So an s sparse vector minus another s sparse vector in general is 2 s sparse. Well, you can play around with those things. They're, they're not too complicated. It's just some reformulation of the main problem. Uh, again, there's equivalence with your statement that for every index set of size at most 2s, the uh, matrix A sub s, a notation that we're going to use a lot, it means the submatrix of A composed with the columns indexed by s. So that matrix is injective or that every set of 2s columns of A is linearly independent. OK, so uh, what can we get out of that? <coughs> so if, if this happens, right, if we are indeed able to recover every s sparse vector as a unique solution of, a, of this linear system, then property number 4 holds. And property number 4 says that uh, whenever you well, 2s columns of A and the columns of A have, have uh, dimension M must be linearly independent, so M has to be larger than 2s. Okay, so that you won't be able to do fewer than 2s measurements. Can you do 2s measurements? In other words, can you satisfy one of those uh, uh, conditions? Well, yes, you can if you choose the matrix A nicely. One way to do that would be, say, you take, a, uh, let's say, a Vandermont matrix or a totally positive matrix of size n times n. Uh, so remove, just keep m colon, m being equal to 2s. right? And then uh, when you take just 2s colons, basically the submatrices that you form in this way are all say, uh, Vandermond matrices as well. Uh, so they are in the determinant is strictly positive. You can even give exactly what the determinant is. Uh, so it's non-zero, so the matrix is injective. So you do have matrices satisfying uh, property number three. So what it says is that the minimum number <laughs> of measurements to do exact sparse recovery is two times s. So at this point, you should say, well, okay, so if, why are we, are we, do we keep going if we, if, we, if we know the solution? We have nice matrices. We, have, we know uh, what is the minimum number of measurements we need to take. We even would be able to know uh, how to take them. It's because of the stability and robustness issue. If you do that, it's not stable and robust. <coughs> and Here's another, uh, well, you might think, well, this is because of, of the Vandermond matrix. It's badly conditioned. Everybody knows that, so it, it's a bad idea to do that. That's why you don't get stability or robustness. Well, it's not exactly that. We will see why uh, later <coughs> on. But here's a, uh, another reconstruction process that takes just two S measurements to recover S sparse vector and not, you know, it tells you exactly which measurements, Fourier measurements that are important in the theory, and uh, consecutive Fourier measurements. Okay, and then that's uh, a simple uh, little algorithm you would see. I'm having some people, I've seen some people name it, read, well, or related to Reed Solomon decoding or called a Cronis algorithm, or I'm not exactly sure of the right uh, nomenclature here, but uh, let's just keep in mind that, uh, you know, in some cases when you want to do sparse recovery and you don't need stability and robustness, don't forget that this exists, this little argument exists. Right. So we have a sparse vector in, well, okay, in that case I take it uh, with complex entries and I identify it as a function on the uh, discrete set 0, 1, 2, n minus 1. Let's call the support 
a capital S uh, of psi zero S. And uh, so we're going to consider its Fourier measurements, the first two S Fourier measurements. This is what is going to be available to us, and we want to recover X from that. So uh, X hat uh, at index J, J from 0 to 2S minus 1, is uh, given in this way. Okay, so uh, this is the J's Fourier measurement. Now, we're going to consider the following trigonometric polynomial, uh, P, which will be the product for K uh, in the support S. So we're not constructing that. You know, to construct P, we would need to know what S is. We don't, but we just consider that for the, uh, the product of 1 minus, uh, so some nice uh, coefficient here times exponential of i 2 pi t over n. And when will that vanish? When this is 0, so when this is 1, so in other words, when t is k for some k in s. So this trigonometric polynomial vanish exactly on s. x vanish exactly on the complement of s. So p pointwise product times x equals 0 as a product of function. And if you take the discrete convolution, uh, so 0 will be the uh, p dot x bound that, but then uh, the convolution of a product is a convolution product of p hat and x hat, okay? Uh, at j, so in, if you expand what those are, it is the sum from k from 0 to n minus 1 of p hat of k times x hat of j minus k. So that is true from for all j from 0 to, to n minus 1. Okay, so uh, now we observe that p hat of 0, so that basically tells you what is the, um, uh, so when we, you look basically at p hat of k in general is the uh, coefficient of the, uh, in, in the trigonometric polynomial p of uh, ei 2 pi k t over n. Right, so the degree, the coefficient of degree k. And if you look at degree 0, so what is the constant term in P? What is the product of the ones? It's 1. Uh, this here is a trigonometric polynomial of degree S, right? Because you, you, it's the product of S monomials. So P hat of k for k larger than S is 0. So if we want to know now P hat, and knowing P hat, we get P as a result. So if we want to know P hat, we just need to know p hat of 1, p hat of 2, up to p hat of k. So we need uh, up to p hat of s. We need s conditions. So the s conditions, uh, we'll get them from uh, these conditions for j from s to 2s minus 1. If you write them explicitly, which I'm not going to do, but you obtain a system of linear equation in p hat of 1, etc., p hat of s, which happens to be a tuplet system. But that actually doesn't matter. Uh, that you know, this knowledge determines exactly p hat. If you have p hat, you recover p. If you have p, you look where it vanishes, and you have the support s. And if you have the support, knowing the two s, you know two s uh, condition on something which has. Uh, S degrees of freedom, or well you can solve and, uh, and finally obtain X. Okay, so it seems that there is a perfectly valid uh, algorithm that will work to recover every S bar vector from a 2S Fourier measurement. And I will actually even want to show you that it does work seemingly if you implement it. So uh, I'm going to. Uh, look at the MATLAB code to illustrate that. Can you actually see what, what is uh, roughly or what we get? So uh, in the first uh, block of code, I'm just defining a vector x with a, uh, so that won't work anymore with my new version of MATLAB, I think. Um, so um, the size of n is 500, s is uh, 18, and uh, I construct the vector x. I anticipated some error here. Uh, just a 
second. Right, so. Thank you. Okay, so I think now. Right, so, uh, okay. Uh, it was, uh, in this case, what I did is, um, I define <coughs> x with support, and then it's random on its support. The way I, I need to change it because I used another version of MATLAB before, where I had the uh, apparently the uh, statistic package, and I don't have it here anymore. Uh, okay, so here x is defined but is unknown. What is known will be uh, the uh, Fourier transform FFT of x, but only on the index from one to two s. Um, and uh, this part of code here is exactly what I said on the slide earlier. Uh, so I'm going to construct uh, the support star, which is what I recover, and I'm going to uh, uh, compare the true support with the recovered support. Probably what it is, yes. Okay, so as you can see, the two are the same. And now, what happens if I add some noise to the measurement? The conclusion will be that it disrupts everything, but the noise I'm going to add is actually very small uh, 0 0.001 times uh, random uh, uh, entries between 0 and 1. And so, uh, to s because I'm going to add it to the uh, y. So the 2s the first Fourier measure. <coughs> and if I do the same thing, what I will obtain is something that is not correct anymore. You can see the difference here. Right? And so there's no way around that. It, it, it is a nice, nice algorithm. It recovers every uh, s sparse vector in 2s, on knowing only 2s for your measurement, but it's not stable, it's not robust. At the end of the week, we will know why it cannot be stable and robust, but uh, it has, you might think, why is because there are some floating point uh, problem or something like that. It, it's not the case. It is, it is more than that. OK, so let's come back to the, um, to the presentation. Uh, I think at this point, I can take some questions, if there are questions. All right, so then I will move to uh, presenting some uh, other reconstruction scheme, other algorithms that might do the, the work. In fact, they will do the work, and uh, I take three representative uh, algorithm that are widely used in the field. So the first one will be L1 minimization. Uh, so we're going to say that we want to solve the problem P0, which was minimize the sparsity subject to the measurement constraint. Um, this is not realistic in general, so can we replace it by a minimization problem which is actually solvable or a convex optimization problem. So what we're going to 
do is replace the L0 norm by the L1 norm. And then I minimize a convex objective subject to some linear constraint. It's a convex uh, problem, and uh, that, that is solvable in practice. In fact, it's even a linear problem, as we'll see. Um, <coughs> and there is some geometric intuition why, why this should work. Uh, in fact, there is more than a geometric intuition. I, I prefer this second intuition personally. Uh, is that when you solve uh, this minimization problem, if the minimizer is unique, it's necessarily already intrinsically sparse, at most m sparse. M, remember, is a number of rows uh, of a. So I'm going to uh, to show you how this works. Uh, Right, so I take Let x a vector of size n, and in my slides, I, I, there was in parentheses when k, the field, is r, not c. In fact, there are a few subtleties in the theory between r and c, and this is one of them. Uh, okay, so I take a, a, a vector uh, of size n. In fact, let's not think of that as the S sparse vector we try to recover, but simply as uh, the, <coughs> so that, that is part of the assumption that there is a unique minimizer uh, of what we're trying to, uh, to minimize, so be the unique minimizer of the uh, one subject to a z equal one. Okay, so x star, x sharp is the unique minimizer uh, of the uh, optimization problem we consider. And what we want to prove is that it is in fact m sparse. Uh, what I'm going to prove, something a little better than that, is that the support uh, <coughs> or Uh, let us prove that the set, I'm going to write A, J. So that represents the J's colon of A. Right. So the set of colon indexed by S, which will be defined as a support of x star is linearly <coughs> okay so independent okay so this set is a set of uh, of vector of size m the columns of a are of size m and then i have uh, a set of linearly independent vectors, so the, the number of them <coughs> should be smaller than m, and the number of them is the sparsity of x, right, the size of the support. Okay, so <coughs> assume the contrary, so assume that There is a linear dependence between the so those uh, those vectors. So there is some um, u j, uh, which are so coefficient times uh, the vector u j. So this is zero. So in other words.
A applied to uh, some vector u is zero for some u a vector uh, which is non-zero, uh, which is supported on F. Okay, a linear dependence uh, between the uh, colon of J. Uh, so that basically means that uh, zero is a matrix multiplication or the matrix vector multiplication A times U where u is equal to those coefficients on S0 outside. Okay? So suppose that uh, this is violated, meaning that there exists such a, a u. Right? So now I'm going to consider uh, z equal x sharp plus t times u. Okay? So T uh, being a real number. Okay. So notice that if I look at A of Z, I've got A of X sharp plus T times A of U. A of U is zero. A of X star well, x star is, satisfies the constraint, so this is equal to y, so this is equal to y. <coughs> Z satisfies the constraint. I think I need to switch board. Okay, so if X sharp is a minimizer subject to uh, some constraint that is met by a Z, we should have that X hat X sharp ZL1 norm is less than ZL1 norm of Z. And a strict inequality, this is why I assume a uniqueness of the minimizer. Now if you look at this L1 norm, it will be the sum uh, for j from 1 to n of sine. So let's write it like that first. Right, this is just the L1 norm. Now, so I wrote that z satisfies the constraints. Note as well that it is supported on s because x sharp is supported on s, u is supported on s. So what comes into play here are just the element j in s. Now, the absolute value is the sine of zj times dj. And dj is, uh, so x sharp j plus t times uj. Now, if t in absolute value is small enough, right, s is the exact support of x uh, sharp. So those are non-zero. But u is a fixed vector. If I take t small enough, I can make those to have exactly the same sign as the sign of x. Okay. Right. So this is equal to the sign of x sharp j if t is small enough. Okay, so it means that I have sum for j in S of sine of x sharp j times x sharp j plus then I'm going to have t coming out of the summation. Uh, and then I have j. So what I obtained is that this L1 norm of x sharp is strictly less than this is again exactly the L1 norm of x sharp. 
plus t, uh, and then whatever it is here, it doesn't matter. What matters is that this has to be true for all t with absolute value of t small enough. But that cannot be true. That cannot be true if this is, let's say, positive. You would take t negative. It's not true. Right? Same if it's positive. It's violated. What if it's 0? Well, if it's 0, it cannot be true because I have a strict inequality. Right? So I do have a contradiction here to uh, the assumption that what I wanted to prove was violated. <coughs> what I wanted to prove is, is indeed true. And in particular, uh, S, the support of X star, has a size at most M. Right? So when you do L1 minimization, you do produce, in the case K equal R, uh, basically things that are already rather sparse. Um, right. So the geometric intuition, and again, I don't want to, to stress that too much, but since you will probably see it, let me, uh, let me show it. Um, let me try to draw an L1 ball first in dimension 3. Right, that's supposed to be a better drone. It's an L1 ball. Right? Uh, measurement constraints of the type AZ equal Y means that uh, Z <coughs> lies in a, a certain hyperplane of equation AZ equal Y. And uh, when you look at the uh, vector that is uh, as minimum L1 norm in this hyperplane, is like you know starting with a very small L1 ball and inflating it until it touches uh, this, this plane. And until it touches this plane, uh, it'll probably touch the plane here at, at this vertex. And the vertex are on the coordinate axis, and this is where you have vectors that are exactly one sparse. Well, I think it's a bad intuition because if, if you take it in, in, uh, in dimension two, the equivalent in dimension two, <coughs> when you inflate the L1 ball, you get you uh, recover a sparse vector, of course. But what if you started with the sparse vector that was here? You don't you don't see it. Right? So um <coughs> to me, the better intuition is this L L1 ball and. The intuition can only be done in three dimensions, but you have to think in higher dimension. Uh, you want to, to pass a plane through that. You want to maybe to put this uh, size of the picture to bring it here to construct at a point which is sparse. Uh, you go and put uh, this corner. You're going to put it here. This corner, you put it here. You're going to put this corner at the back, etc. And then you ask yourself, can I draw a plane or a line that goes through the empty space that's left between all those corners when they are put in just one point. And uh, well, it takes some picturing back in dimension two. Uh, you, you won't be able to fit a plane. You will be able, in dimension three, you won't be able to fit a plane. You're going to be only able to fit a line. And that reflects the minimum number of measurements, which in this case would be 2s with s equal 1, number of measurements being equal to 2. So the dimension of the hyperplane, which is capital N minus m, is 1, a line. You cannot fit a, a plane. All right, so <coughs> but the main point was uh, the intuition for the L1 uh, uh, minimization was that you produce sparse vector, and of course, it is nice because the problem, minimization problem considered is solvable. Uh, so 
in the uh, real case, another uh, <laughs> example where there is a little difference between the uh, real case and the complex case is uh, it becomes, in fact, a linear problem. So the one of the way to, to see that is to, uh, when you minimize the sum of the absolute value of zj, to say, well, I'm going to minimize instead an upper bound for that. Uh, uh, in fact, the sum of upper bounds for each of the absolute value of zj. So you're going to introduce a slack variable c, where you're going to say that cj has to be larger or equal to absolute value of zj, and that translates into uh, those inequalities for j from 1 to capital N. Now, and you've replaced absolute value of zj by cj. So you've doubled the size of the optimization problem, but everything else, the objective function is linear, uh, and then the constraints are linear as well. So it's a linear problem in this case. If you do the same thing, uh, in the uh, same trick in the uh, complex case, and you say that the modulus of zj is less than some cj, while the modulus is the square root of square of the imaginary part and square of the uh, real part. So it's not linear anymore. It's a second order cone problem. All right. So <coughs> there is, uh, so if we ask ourselves the question, if I start with an S sparse vector x, and let's say I even know its support. The support is, let's say, capital S. Uh, do I recover x as the minimization of this, of this uh, problem here? So in other words, a when do I have the delta 1? Delta 1, I didn't write it, but uh, delta 1 is the L1 minimization here. Delta 1 applied to Ax equal to x for every vector x supported on x, if and only if. There's an if and only if, and only if condition called the null space property, which says that whenever you take u in the null space of A, take u uh, non-zero, then the weight of the L1 norm on S on this small set cannot be too large, so it has to be smaller than the weight of the L1 norm on the complement of S. S bar is the notation I'm using for the complement of S. Okay, so it's a property of the null space because it only depends on the null space of A. So it's an if and only if condition. It's not too hard to see it. Uh, we can even go in one direction by uh, uh, just without r having to write too much or nothing at all. Uh, suppose that every sparse vec su vector supported on X is recovered by L1 minimization. Now take U in the null space of A. Right? It means that A of U equals 0. Decompose U as U sub S plus U sub S bar. So A of this sum is 0 means that A of us equal to A of negative of u of s bar. So two vectors with the same uh, measurements, one of them supported on s, so it has to have the smallest L1 norm. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, if you look at this condition and take a measurement matrix, you might ask yourself, but what are we talking about here? What is the null space of A? Are we talking about the real null space or the complex null space? Right? Uh, because you can think of U as a real vector in the null space, but if it's a complex vector, the real part and the imaginary part of this vector are both uh, real vectors that also are in the null space. So there was basically two... Uh, ways to, to see, uh, to understand the null space property, where well, you're thinking of the uh, real version, which is basically this spelled out, or the complex version, which is this spelled out, but when u is v plus i, the imaginary number square root of minus 1, u is v plus i w, where both of them are real vectors. And that, you know, are the uh, modulus of the uh, uj. Now, they seem different at first sight. Of course, this one implies that one by taking one of those vectors to be 0. But in fact, it turns out that 
they are the same same property. This is not I, I don't want to or maybe I would do want uh, I won't do it. Uh, but maybe uh, you can ask me and I can show you how it's done. But it's a it's a nice little proof in a few lines. Uh, but again here I'm just to show some differences between the real and complex case and uh, where the, you know, the it has an influence where it does not have an influence. By the way, when you have a complex you know, real measurement matrix and you're trying to recover a complex vector, uh, and then you have y equal ax, you can also say that your complex vector can decompose the real part and, and the imaginary part and form a system of uh, equation that is twice the size but where everything is real in there. You can also do that. <coughs> and I want to finish uh, spending maybe five minutes on, on uh, two further algorithms. So that was an algorithm based on convex optimization. And so there are alternatives, uh, iterative algorithm. And I want to uh, show you two of them. The first one, orthogonal matching pursuit. The second one, iterative heart thresholding. Um, so orthogonal matching pursuit, um, the m idea behind the algorithm is to say, well, I'm going, I want to construct basically a sparse vector or find its support, and the support should have small size. So what if I try to construct the support one step at a time by adding an index uh, at each iteration? And this is precisely what we do, right? So OMP has two steps. The first step is to, you know, at iteration n plus 1, you keep the support given at iteration n, so Sn, and you add something. And let's not look at what we add for the moment. Then the second step is to say, okay, so I have a given support. Let's try to find the uh, vector that is supported on Sn plus 1, uh, you know, the, the current support. Uh, that best fits the measurements in the sense that AZ is as close as possible to Y. And doing that is solving a, a so it, it's a least square problem, but basically it's solving a, a system of equation of size, the size of uh, SN plus 1, which is N plus 1. Okay? Now, the norm of the residual, so the residual is y minus a applied to uh, your current estimation of x, decreases. Right? Uh, and decreases in a given way. In fact, so this is uh, the residual at step n plus 1 is smaller than the residual at step n minus uh, that quantity, which is a star applied to the current residual taken at the new uh, index you're adding to the set and take that squared modulus squared. And that doesn't depend on, on what you add. So the way you see that is simply you say, okay, so I'm going to look at uh, xn and I'm going to add something on the new index and try to minimize over that. And if you minimize over that, you obtain the uh, right-hand side. And of course, the left-hand side is what you can get the smallest you can get. Right. So you've got this bound. And when you have this bound, you, you can ask, you can say, well, okay, I want, I'm greedy. I want this residual to decrease past at each step. So I want to make this large. And making this large, this dictates the choice of, uh, of Jn plus 1. Of course, it's a, just a bound for that. But it turns out that in, in most situations, it's, it's not a bad bound. Right? So this would be, in fact, you can replace that by an equality where what you subtract is, in fact, very close to, uh, to this quantity. OK. So um, there is also an if and only if condition for the success of orthogonal matching pursuit. And I'm going to stress that the success in S iteration. S being the size of the support, right? You, you consider a given support, and you ask yourself, what is a necessary and sufficient condition to be able to recover every uh, vector supported on S? Uh, 
in just S iteration of OMP, S iteration, because after S iteration, the size of the uh, support you've constructed is, is S as well. So uh, <coughs> the, it's called this if and only if condition, exact recovery condition. Uh, so you want, for technical reason, uh, that AES to be injective, and also that whenever you take a vector which is of the form AZ with Z supported on, on S, when you apply A star to such a vector, the largest entry will occur on S. So the maximum for J over S here is larger than the maximum for L over S bar of this quantity there. L like the um, neural space property, there's one direction that you can basically see uh, quickly. It's uh, in this direction here. Uh, so if you were to take, uh, let's see, uh, take a vector of this form, AZ, with, uh, so you start with x0 equals 0, so uh, what you want to do when you construct J1 uh, is to maximize A star, so Y will take the role of AZ, and AX0 will be 0. So you want the first index you construct to be in the support. Right? Because if you construct something that's not in the support already, you're, you're doomed from the start. And uh, being in the support means that you want uh, that, the, again, the maximum uh, of all index in this support to be the entries here to be larger than whatever else you can find outside the support. So that direction is, is easy. The other direction is not that easy. It's done by induction, but it's, it's not too bad. At, yes? What if you don't know A star? Oh, A star, by the way. A star is the transpose of A. Yeah. So you, you, you always assume that you know A. It is always assumed that A is known. And let me finish by just uh, introducing uh, another iterative algorithm, iterative house for shoulding. Uh, so again, we want to solve the system AX equal Y. We will know that X is sparse, but still it's a rectangular system. And uh, we know how to solve square systems, so let's multiply by A star on both sides, the transpose of A, uh, and then we have a square system. Okay. Uh, now, classical uh, iterative methods suggest to, to, to iterate <coughs> the following steps. So xn plus 1 equals xn plus a star times y minus axn. And I'm going to maybe tomorrow tell you why in, in for good matrices A, this is even more intuitive than that. Uh, but we don't stop there, right? because we want to produce sparse vectors. So at each iteration, on top of doing that, then there is a step where we keep only the S largest uh, entries in absolute value uh, of, of, of that vector. And all the rest is set to zero. So in other words, <coughs> iterative R thresholding is the iteration of this step here, where HS is the R thresholding operator that keep the S largest absolute entries of a vector, set the other ones to zero. Now this has some advantages because what you do is only apply the matrix A, multiply it to a vector. I recall the second step of OMP was uh, a least square step. So it's solving a linear system, which is uh, more costly than doing that. Uh, so here the iterations are very cheap themselves. If solving a least square problem is, you know, it's okay with you, at each iteration you could also do the following, so half shoulding for suit, which is basically the same thing, but it's in two steps. So you still form that vector, and you still look at the S laps largest absolute entries of that, but rather than just keeping them, you say, okay, so that would be my support, and on this support, let's just look at the vector with this support that best fits the measurement. And that will be your new, new uh, uh, iterate xn plus 1. So it has several advantages. 
and of course it's on pages. One thing that I like is that uh, there is definite stopping criterion here. Right here you have to iterate that to the limit and to infinity. Here you can stop and it's, it often happens when the uh, two uh, supports at n and n plus 1 are the same because afterwards you're just going to do the same thing over and over again. So when, when that happens, you, you just stop your, your iteration. All right. So um, I guess right on time almost. Uh, that, will be, uh, that will be it for today. Or do I have to talk again today? No? No. Not today. Uh, so what I'm going to do next, so here I, I showed you, uh, I, you know, I haven't done anything. I presented you uh, a few things, but why would they work, those algorithms, these three algorithms that I've given you? Uh, under what condition on the matrix A? And so this is what I'm going to do then tomorrow, present some condition on, on the matrix A, good matrices for comparative sensing, and prove for at least two of them, of those algorithms, uh, that uh, you do indeed output the uh, true S path solution. And thank you for your attention. So, no, we were not able to, to prove anything on the matrix, except if, if you accept as a proof uh, a numerical evidence. Uh, I mean more than numerical evidence. So, let me come back to the null space property. Right, if you add here, uh, a a condition that your vector, uh, you know, the sine of x, for example, you would replace the L1 norm by the sum of the sine of x times uj, uh, j in s. Now, the sine of x would be positive in our case, uh, and uh, this condition is uh, uh, basically, you can look at that as verifying this condition as solving a linear program. And we've done that. And we've done it for several supports, and it is true. But then uh, we would have to do it for you know, all the supports, and that is, uh, as I said, uh, not possible. But from what we observed, and that does not consist of mathematical proof, but from what we observe, this signed null space property is true for the uh, KMR matrix. The full null space property will not be true. This is why I said we are not able to recover vectors that are not non-negative, but only the ones that are non-negative. That answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yes. 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 Yeah. And I think I will show that tomorrow. ERC implies no space property. So if you are able to recover vectors by OMP, you are able to recover vectors by L1 integration. Not, not always. So when I do those vectors, I mean those, those algorithms, yes, it's true, right? Orthogonal matching pursuit, I need to stop somewhere. If I say I stop at S iteration, I'm assuming that I know S. If I do uh, those algorithms, I also assuming that I know S. If you do L1 minimization, and I guess I should have pointed out that's really that's uh, an advantage of doing L1 minimization, you don't need the knowledge of S here at all. So it it has you know big advantage here with this respect.